Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is June 20th, 2017, and my guest is Martha Nussbaum, the Ernst Freund Distinguished Service Professor of Law and Ethics appointed in the Law School and Philosophy Department at the University of Chicago. She appeared on Econ Talk in September of 2014 to talk about her book, Creating Capabilities. Our topic for today is Alexander Hamilton, the man, and especially the musical and the ideas in that musical, based on an essay that she wrote, Hamilton's Choice, that appeared in the Boston Review. Martha, welcome back to Econ Talk. Well, thanks very much. It's good to be back. Before we begin, I want to remind listeners that there may be some spoilers ahead about the musical or Hamilton's life. If you don't know what happens to him at the end of his life, you might want to miss this one until you've seen the show or read the journal biography. But most of you probably have an idea what's happening. Now, Martha, you frame your essay around what you call Hamilton's choice, tying Hamilton to a classic uh, story that the Stoics would tell about Hercules. Explain. Okay, so in the ancient philosophical world, they had to appeal to young people and tell them why they should go in for thinking hard, studying hard, doing philosophy. And so they told this myth that the great hero Hercules is faced with a choice, and there are two goddesses who appear to him, and one of them is called Virtue, and she says, do good deeds and pursue justice, and that will be a great life. And the other one in in the original myth was called pleasure, and it just says, well, drink and have sex and be merry and so on. And uh, that one, the Stoic philosophers rewrote a little bit because obviously that that version is an obvious loser. And so it turned into the life of fame, the life of positional preeminence, like try to be the person that everyone is talking about, try to be the one who's on the inside of whatever is going on. And so then the young person is supposed to make a choice between those two paths. And and in the end, of course, you're supposed to see that the life of virtue and creation is is the better life. I couldn't help but think of our mutual friend, Adam Smith, who in the theory of moral sentiments, and Smith, of course, was influenced by the Stoics. He says, uh, this is a quote, Uh, Two different roads are presented to us equally leading to the attainment of this so much desired object, meaning to be loved and people paying attention to you. The one by the study of wisdom and the practice of virtue, the other by the acquisition of wealth and greatness. Two different characters are presented to our emulation, the one of proud ambition and ostentatious avidity, the other of humble modesty and equitable justice. Two different models, two different pictures are held out to us according to which we may fashion our own character and behave character and behavior. The one more gaudy and glittering in its coloring, the other more correct and more exquisitely beautiful uh-huh. in its outline. And that really is the, that's the same choice, right? Yeah, I, I had forgotten that passage. That's wonderful. And of course, now, when you think about Smith himself, it becomes even more interesting because he was a very severe professor of philosophy. Then he went into politics and he actually uh, didn't have much of a capacity for politics. He worked for the customs office, but because he was a hypochondriac and he was always sick and he lived with his mother all his life and was kind of a weakling and mama's boy, he he really didn't do very well in the life of politics. But I think he always envied those very dashing, strong figures. So he really did have, he was a little bit torn himself about which life was better, the the dashing life or the studious and serious life. I think you're being a little tough on him. I I think he's, (laughs) in the theory of moral sentiments, he's extremely disdainful of the rich and powerful. Uh, And in particular, I think calling him a being living in the world of politics because he held a bureaucratic job, I think is a bit might be a bit of a stretch. But what I do think is right and where I do agree with you is that he held himself out. He took the less glittering path. He was quiet and a philosopher, as you say, and an author and a teacher, a tutor. And yet he became world famous and and his wealth in terms of fame and, and greatness is 
quite large. So he, he got the best of both worlds. Well, yes. I mean, but I think I'm not talking about worship of the rich, which of course he didn't have. But he does love and really describes in loving detail certain heroic dashing figures, such as the Native Americans, whom he forms a strange fascination with, and he likes to imagine how they lived and how they died being tortured. Yes, that's but true. nonetheless, they're very courageous. And so, stoic so, nature. No, that was what I was thinking about. Yeah. And of course, he doesn't like the rich, but he does like another kind of rather obvious bodily kind of heroism. That's for sure. And it, that's his stoic side, their ability to of, of, of native people, I think he uses more than one example to endure pain and and to and to do it with with grace and. Uh, but I don't think my only point was he, he really did not care for the aristocracy or the um, no, no, or the, or the, not. the no. powerful necessarily. So yeah. so what is this choice that we all face between fame and money on one side and virtue and wisdom on the other? To some extent, we all face it. Uh, what's that have to do with Hamilton? Okay, so. There are lots of careers that people can go into where this choice comes up because you have to choose as a scholar whether you just focus on doing what you think the truth is and pursuing truth or whether you have to do politics in the scholarly world, trying to get ahead of other people or get a job when 10 people are applying for it. And, you know, even in the world of scholarship, which is relatively pure of that kind of bad competition, you got to compete or else you don't get the job. And so you have to learn how to compete. You have to, I train my graduate students of how to go on the job market, how to do a good job interview and all that stuff. Now, if you're maybe a poet, you have to do less of that. Like in an era where women could never compete because no one wanted to have them around, Emily Dickinson could write the wonderful poetry she did just sitting in her room and uh, lots of other cases of, of that same thing. If, if Once you get the paper and the pencil, then nothing stops you so long as you have enough to eat and a place to write. But there are some careers where this choice is, is much more complicated. And I think politics is, is perhaps the most complicated where, yeah, you go into politics wanting to serve humanity, wanting to create something that's lasting wanting to do what's right and just, but given that it's politics and especially democratic politics, right? Because if you're in a monarchy, you might just get to do it by being born in the right family. But in democracy, you have to compete and you have to please people and you have to seek votes and so on. So I think Hamilton is all about these two aspects of a political career and how they're in a very difficult kind of tension with each other. Now, Hamilton's main interest, as the musical presents him, but I think it's true in real life, is to create. He says, I want to build something that's going to outlive me. And the musical presents that, I think, very, very well. But in order to do that, he has to get powerful friends. So he has to befriend George Washington, who becomes his kind of surrogate father. He has to later try to win some elections. And so he can't avoid playing that game. And on the other side is Aaron Burr, who in real life, I think, as in the musical, didn't really stand for anything, didn't have anything that he particularly wanted to create. But he was a consummate insider, always trying to position himself. And the great song in the musical that defines him is the room where it happens. He just wants to be an insider, to be in the room where it happens. To be a player. Yeah. And of course, if, you, if that's what you want, then it's better perhaps not to have any firm convictions. So Burr says to Hamilton, don't let them know what you're against or what you're for. To which Hamilton replies, you can't be serious. Right. So uh, that's the, the, the choice. Now, the difficult thing about the choice is that in this society where American society was full of honor culture, a lot of ranking of people as to their honor, you have to play the game of competition and honor in order to get to the position where you can really create. And so here we get to the topic of dueling, which is a motif that runs all the way through the musical, just as it ran through everyone's life. So people fought duels to establish that they were honorable people. And there was this elaborate culture where if you were insulted, 
your honor was called into question. Then you had to challenge the person to a duel. If you couldn't get an apology, then you had to fight the duel. And maybe sometimes you tried not to shoot to kill, but sometimes you did. In any case, Hamilton, by the time we get to the actual challenge of Burr, he does not want to fight duels. He's been convinced that on religious grounds and on human grounds, it's immoral. His son was killed in a duel, and that's probably a main reason why he comes to that conclusion. But he also knows that if he doesn't accept the challenge to a duel, that's an ungentlemanly thing to do, and it would forfeit his public role in American politics. And so he he has a very profound dilemma, and in in real life, that is absolutely the way he he saw it. And uh, so he thinks that Burr is actually correct. I mean, he, he... Burr says Hamilton has insulted him, and um, Hamilton sort of says, he says, hey, I have not been shy. I'm just a guy in the public eye trying to do the best for our republic. I don't want to fight, but I won't apologize for doing what's right. So that's what he says to Burr. He says, Burr, your grievance is legitimate. I stand by what I said, every bit of it. You stand only for yourself. It's what you do. I can't apologize because it's true. So then the question is what to do. And uh, the the fact is that Hamilton in real life wrote a very poignant letter, which he, it was a kind of a public statement describing his reasons for accepting Burr's challenge, despite the fact that he didn't agree with dueling. And so let me just read you a bit of this letter, because I think it's very moving. All the considerations which constitute what men of the world denominate honor impressed on me, as I thought, a peculiar necessity not to decline the call, the ability to be in future useful, whether in resisting mischief or effecting good in those crises of our public affairs, which seem likely to happen, would probably be inseparable from a conformity with public prejudice in this particular. So that's a quote from the historical letter. It's not exactly that way in the musical, but the sentiments are the same. So so he's realized he doesn't want to play this game of one-upsmanship and being in the room and so on, but he's got to play it or else no one will listen to him when he tries to do something important and good. So then he goes out to New Jersey, which was the, the land of lawlessness where everyone fought the duels thinking they wouldn't be arrested. And uh, of course, Burr shoots to kill and he is killed. So uh, that's the tragedy of Hamilton's ambition. There are really two moments in the musical, they mirror what happened in real life, where Hamilton has a choice to respond to uh, a crisis, that, the one you just mentioned, and he clearly refuses to uh, reduce the tension or lower the flame with Burr. He could have said, ah, I was just kidding. He that seems like a personal a set of a piece of personal integrity. The letter you're writing suggests he wanted to be a player, like you said, he wanted to be useful, he wanted to create, he wanted to have an impact on the world, and he knew he'd reduce his ability to do that if he didn't abide by the norms, even though those norms were uh, illegal, as as you alluded to. The other moment is when he's accused of uh, infidelity. And it looks like his infidelity is a form of corruption. It looks like he's been funneling money off to himself. What he's really been doing is playing, paying blackmail to uh, the woman he was uh, unfaithful with, to, with and her husband. And it's an interesting thing there as well, the way it's at least portrayed in the musical, that he's, he's not going to lie. He's not going to spin. He comes across with a lot of dignity. He's, he's, he's made a terrible mistake. He's betrayed his wife, which, of course, is a huge theme of the second act of the musical. He's betrayed his wife, betrayed his own principles. Um, Here again, with the duel, he doesn't want to do it. He thinks it's wrong, but he feels he has to – he's wearing a straitjacket of honor and and virtue, as as you allude to. And uh, he gets punished terribly for both of those pieces of uh, virtue. He is – by admitting his infidelity, he really has a huge negative impact on his political career – and, uh, of course, the duel kills him. Yeah, that's very well put. And I think the motif of the sexual infidelity is also a very interesting thickening of the polarity between Hamilton and Burr. Because Hamilton is a creep toward his wife. 
he was uh, called by Martha Washington a tomcat, or she named her favorite tomcat, uh, Hamilton, to indicate that he was just a very, he was a real womanizer. And after he got married, maybe for a while he settled down, but not, not for too long. And he had this affair. And um, even though the musical does portray the relationship with his wife as quite a, a deep one, I don't know how accurate that actually sure. is. But So he was a creep in that realm, whereas Burr, is pretty interesting in this respect. He marries a woman that's 15 years older than he is, Theodosia. He does appear to love her. And indeed, the, the musical's great song about love, Love Doesn't Discriminate Between the Sinners and the Saints, It Takes and It Takes and It Takes, is assigned to Burr and not to Hamilton. Then Theodosia dies very quickly, but they have a daughter first who's also named Theodosia. And that Theodosia was the apple of Burr's eye. He made her the hostess at all his dinner parties. He taught her Latin and Greek. He taught her how to hunt and shoot. He really was a feminist, and not just by accident, because he kept a portrait of the feminist uh, philosopher, Mary Wollstonecraft, on the wall in the study in his room. That's not in the musical, but it was true in real life. And also in real life, he introduced the first bill for women to have the vote in the New York State legislature. And it's, I mean, like the first we know about anywhere, because um, it wasn't until like 150 years later that women really started getting the vote. And we know that in England, John Stuart Mill introduced a motion for women to have the vote in 1872. But here we're talking 1790. And Burr is already in favor of women, women having the vote. So he was in that area. He was complicated and deep and somewhat heroic. He adored Theodosia, the daughter, who unfortunately died at sea in a a ship capsized at sea. And then then the rest of his life was kind of aimless with women and so on. But but he really did love that daughter. And so the musical is great because it doesn't make the choice easy. And so in this other area, you're quite right that Hamilton is truthful. He has a lot of integrity. But before that, he was a real creep. I mean, this woman is he was a player and she was just uh, lured him into a casual liaison and then blackmailed him. So it wasn't like it was a deep love of any kind. And he, he was just Flawed. interested Flawed. in womanizing. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that's um, so it was very interesting. And I, there's also the possibility that he just liked the sound of his own voice too much. That's mentioned in the musical as in real life that Hamilton always said twice as much yeah. on any issue as any other person. So like any speech he made in the assembly was a couple of hours long and anything he wrote was just, he, he had a kind of verbal uh, flow that was excessive. And some people did think that that pamphlet he wrote confessing his own adultery was an example of that, that he just loved to dramatize his own life. It's almost like the, the days of the internet were anticipated, you know, where people love to sensationalize their own lives by publicizing everything they do sexually. So there was a little bit of that in Hamilton. Yeah, human nature hasn't changed uh, since the 18th century. I always like to remind myself of that. It's very important. As you point out, the the Burr's character is uh, complex and rich, and he has many admirable things about him, which makes the musical and the real life story uh, more powerful because he's not just a cardboard villain who's who, who kills Hamilton in a you know in a in a fit or in in anger. He feels his honor's been harmed, and he has many redeeming point moments throughout the throughout the show. Uh, without going to the ones that you just mentioned, of course, what's interesting is that. His shot kills two people, really. It kills Hamilton and it kills himself. And I think there's a – I can't remember the line, but there's a moment of awareness there that, you know, Burr, after after that – after martyring Hamilton, essentially, he becomes a um, a cardboard character. He's not uh, – he's, he's irredeemable in, in, by history. And, and Miranda's yeah, really – I dumb. agree. Okay. I mean, if you read Laura Vidal's novel, Burr, well, he, he – it isn't like – that one event does him in. It's rather that he goes on for, of course, another 
long time. He doesn't die until almost the age of 90. And uh, he leads this strange rebellion in some of the Western territories, trying to establish a separate republic. But it's like the same things in his character that made him behave badly with Hamilton make him a traitor to his country in that other incident. And so it's not so much that that incident did him in, but it was part of, a, I think, a lifelong pattern that he just didn't have a sense of honor, true honor. He didn't have a sense of integrity, and he was willing to do things that aggrandized himself but but not totally dumb things. Like this rebellion, you know, if it had succeeded, then there would have been another country and Burr would have been like the king of that country. So it was a, a fantasy that wasn't totally ridiculous that he got, got taken in by. I'm just and suggesting then, it, it didn't turn out so well for him. Well, it did not <laughs> turn out. I mean, but but he in the meantime, he was received by everyone after the, brouhaha about the duel ebbed away, you know, he was received in in, uh, American society and in European society. He met all kinds of fancy people in England. He talked to the founder of utilitarianism, Jeremy Bentham, and they formed quite a friendship. So, you know, he had a pretty complicated and interesting life after that. And I think Gore Vidal's novel, Burr, is very good because it's told mostly from the point of view of Burr. And so what's so interesting is to see how the personality of Burr is sort of like a yellow stain spreading over everything. This enviousness changes the way he recounts all the episodes that we know about from history. So Washington comes off as a real dummy and a dupe of Hamilton. Of course, Hamilton comes off very badly. So I I really do think that novel is a great example of what in literary discourse is called the unreliable narrator, where you to see how different the world looks from Burr's eyes. But, but he, you know, if you think about whether a Burr could ever succeed and how far could a Burr succeed, it, it, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think, you know, when we think about people who've had spectacular falls from grace, someone like Richard Nixon, for example, I don't think that he is a Burr, really. I think he had a lot more of Hamilton in him and really had grand ideas about the opening to China. And so it's not surprising that John Adams' great opera, Nixon in China, shows us a Hamiltonian Nixon, if you will, like a Nixon with big ideas and true love of what he was doing. I think that part was real. And then the other part was there too. So Nixon is the the, 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 the example of where the kind of the envy, honor part ended up doing in the good part. And maybe Burr just didn't have the honor part at all, but well, he certainly got pretty far. I want to come back to the envy, and we'll, we'll go into that in some detail. But I want to, I want to digress for a second on something you said a few minutes ago that's haunting me. Um, listeners to this program know that I'm not uh, a big fan of, of. There are a lot of politicians uh, I don't like, and my general attitude towards party politics is a pox on both their houses. But uh, it's interesting that you made the point that that to be a player, certainly in the United States, uh, democracy, you have to do some things. Uh, you have to break a few eggs to make make an omelet to get into power to do things. Even if you're good, even if your intentions are good, which is where you started, that, that people go into politics to try to make the world a better place. You, you, you conceded that people, of course, to get there, have to often do things that are not so virtuous. And certainly, Smith was Adam Smith was very aware of this and, and talked about it a lot. Uh, and he also saw that as as the case in business as well. I think that was more true in his time perhaps than ours, but maybe not. But my point is, is that I, I never thought about this. You said unless you get to be a monarch, in which case you don't have to do those things to get into power because you've already got it through heredity or whatever. And yet I think most monarchs are remarkably more despicable than most democratic leaders because of the role of co- that competition. So I, I keep thinking back to uh, – one of my favorite econ talk episodes of all time with Bruce Wayne de Mesquita, where he mentioned that King Leopold was revered in Belgium and despised in the Congo. In the Congo, he was he was an absolute emperor. He could do whatever he wanted. In mm-hmm. Belgium, he was constrained by parliament. And he did some progressive things in Belgium that a lot of people liked. In the Congo, he was a murderer and a, and a, and a thief and a looter. And um, – 
so it's interesting. You know, we can bemoan with a, you know, the the half empty glass of democracy and its and its political ugliness, but compared to the alternatives, it's it's not so bad. Well, I think that's a great point. Of course, with monarchs, they also just um, there's this lottery aspect that people of absolutely no ability at all end up being monarchs uh, because they just are the (laughs) first oldest son and so on. And you see this in Shakespeare's history plays where people like Richard II and Henry VI are perfectly fine people, but they should never have been running anything. And they couldn't really run anything. And uh, Henry VI probably should have just gone and become a priest or whatever he thinks he wants to be. But uh, so there's, there's that aspect. But I do think you're right that democracy constrains people in certain ways and um, absolutely right. But it also means that you've got to be willing to really play the the game of getting people on your side if you're going to do anything fine in democracy. So let's take the contrast between Lyndon Johnson and Jimmy Carter. Oh, I'm okay? just thinking about Lyndon Johnson. I love uh, Lyndon so Johnson's Carter, portrait. An honorable the- <laughs> person. You know, honorable person, but he couldn't get anything done. He had no ability to play that game of compromise and putting together a group of people, et cetera. Whereas Johnson, I mean, if you, I've been through all the volumes of Robert Caro's wonderful biography. Incredible book. And he's certainly, in some ways, a very despicable person with lot, very little marital honor, little personal honor. But, you know, when he wanted to get the Civil Rights Act passed, he knew how to wheel and deal. He knew how to use whatever he had on people to get them to vote for it and to make some package that they could support. So, you know, I'm glad that we had Johnson at that time in our nation's history. I think that if we had had Jimmy Carter at that time, we never got, would have gotten the Civil Rights Act. Right? Wait, you're glad you glad we had him because you were married to him. Uh, although, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who he crushed ruthlessly on his way to being able oh, to sure, do that. Sure. And I will never forget. Oh, I, I, I encourage somebody out there listening to find the page. It's in the second volume, if I remember correctly, of the Carol biography where LBJ Johnson needs the endorsement of a racist. Uh, I think he's got a the guy's got a music show. I can't remember the exact details. And Johnson doesn't want this guy's endorsement because he's a he's a wicked man, and he can't. He t- within a span of about uh, fifteen minutes or so in the book, or it's a page, he talks himself into why it's a good thing to get it because he's going to do all this good once he gets into into the Senate and into power. And uh, it's a very slippery slope. Uh, and a lot of people, of course, unconstrained by democracy, climb over a lot of bodies to get into that power and then just use it mainly to help themselves. Yeah, and, and when I think about which big political leaders I really like and I would love to meet and be friends with and so on, it turns out that they're usually people who didn't quite come up through the rough and tumble of democracy. I'm thinking particularly of India's great first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. Now, Nehru was elevated because he was already a Kashmiri Brahmin. He was aristocratic to the core. If you listen to recordings of his speeches on Indian independence, he sounds like he's from the most upper crust British school. I mean, he's just not an Indian Democrat. Gandhi was much more a, a man of the people. But Nehru was a a very introspective person of beautiful character, I think, who loved his family, his wife, his daughter, loved his friends, and was very, very honorable. But he never could have been elevated in today's India, which is a pure, much more a pure democracy, because then he would have had to have traits of competitiveness and party politics that he just didn't have. So, you know, it's very complicated, I think. It maybe what what it teaches us is that we we might want something that combines the rough and tumble of democratic politics with a, a respect for ideas, with a respect for the leadership of I don't know thoughtful people, which right now we I think we don't have so much in our country. Let's go back to envy. Um, you say. Uh a society that re- a quote a society that rejects orders and destinies in favor of mobility and competition opens the door wide to envy the positional achievements of others if envy is sufficiently widespread it can eventually threaten polit- threaten political order 
particularly when a society has committed itself to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, how does envy play out in Hamilton, and how do you see it playing out in America today? Okay, well, let me just talk a little about the emotion itself, because there's a lot of stuff written about envy. John Rawls, the great political philosopher, devoted a long discussion to envy in a theory of justice. So how is it, what is it like, and how is it different from jealousy? So envy is a painful emotion that focuses on the fact that other people are enjoying good things and you're not. So the difference from jealousy that people usually identify is that jealousy is all about competition for a preferred rival, and it's about insecurity that the person feels vis a very particular person or particular rival. And to that extent, and jealousy can be satisfied because you might just come to the conclusion that your spouse really loves you, your spouse is not unfaithful, and unless you're a rather pathological character like uh, Othello or like um, the character in Proust's novel, where jealousy is never satisfied, then jealousy is not going to destroy you in, in most uh, human situations. But thinking about envy, it's really Iago, not Othello, who's the envy person, because what he wants is position. He wants the good things of life. And when he sees Othello enjoying it, and he doesn't, there's a kind of bottomless pit that opens up, this feeling of hopelessness toward the good things in life, that you see someone else as being on top, and you're not. Uh, so what John Rawls does is to then ask, okay, clearly that could destabilize democracy, so what can we say about under what conditions would envy not be such a destabilizing factor in democracy? And what he says, I think, is, is really, really interesting. Namely, what we first of all have to do is to arrange to show people that their efforts can bear fruit. There's some good thing they can achieve just by being the people they are. They're, they're not going to be cut out entirely. And, well, we can do this by having good employment opportunities, having a good social safety net, and things of this sort. And um, we can also do it by kind of narrowing the gap between the top and the bottom. Because what is happening with Iago is the general is very different from his aide-de-camp. And he, he just knows he's not going to get to be the general. So if we have a society like that where there's a few people who are on top and everyone else is kind of in the outer darkness, that's not so good because then there could be a real rebellion of envy. And so what we have to do is to try to narrow the gap between the bottom and the top and show that there are lots of things that you can do to get yourself into a good position. And then what I would add to this, and I, I guess I, I do it in the piece by thinking about a high school, which is, I think, a veritable cauldron of envy. Well, I think I don't do it actually in the published version of the piece. Yeah, it was yeah, I don't think it's version, in there, but, but yeah, it certainly is anyway, a cauldron of envy. That's yeah, for it, sure. It, it, it's a good, <laughs> good way of thinking about it. What could a high school do to not be a cauldron of envy? Well, so one thing is to focus on lots of different things that people can do to achieve. So if you can have sports stars, fine, and they're going to be the popular kids, fine. But you can also encourage achievement in the arts. You can encourage achievement in, <laughs> heaven help us, even scholarship, maybe. Sure. And, um, you know, my daughter went to a school where they had an arts Olympics alongside the sports Olympics, and that was really good for her because she hated sports and wasn't very good in sports. So, um, you know, these are the things that you can do, just a, a number of different paths to a kind of positional achievement. And so, th so these are thoughts that I think we have to have in, our, in American society because there are probably, there are several paths to preeminence, but not enough because there's the cult of celebrity, there's the cult of sports stars, and then there's politics. All of these revolving around fame, and all of those things create a lot of envy. But I think it would be a good thing for our society to do much more to honor school teaching, to honor people who serve in various ways, you know, various service jobs, nursing, taking care of 
aging people, if the society could recognize those achievements and give them preeminence, that would be an extremely good thing to do. But well, also, I think we need to narrow narrow the gap and have more of a social safety net because then people, whatever they're feeling they lack, at least they have basic wherewithal of security and a basically flourishing life. And, and I think in Europe, you, you often achieve that kind of sense of security. Well, we could devote an entire show to that um, issue, to this issue, and I, I don't want to. Um, I don't want to talk too long a response. I just would say two things, trying to be brief. One is it's such a corrosive emotion. I can think of few things I wish more for my children than to not feel envy at the success of others and to rejoice in the success of others instead. And I wonder if our politics in catering to it is making two mistakes. First of all, for all you know. In the last uh, eight years, we really changed the incomes at the top. And in fact, the gap has gotten smaller. But you only know that. And you, only, you can perceive it in a high school, the gap. You can't perceive it in a country. The only way you perceive it in a country is through data. The data are often flawed. But if the data were different, the idea that somehow that would be compensation or make you feel better or less envious if you were told that the top CEO only made X times instead of 2X times or 10X times more than the average person, it's just like a really bad political strategy to cater to that emotion and to then allow people to – Market it, which is what we we have now uh, on both sides of the political spence, and I think it's I think it's incredibly destructive. So I don't see that as the as the way to um, to solve the problem. I do think we should create capabilities. You and I agree on that that we can give people the chance to transform <laughs> yeah. themselves personally. But to always be worrying about the gap between me and someone else, I think is it's the road to unhappiness at the individual level, and it's the road to to, to tyranny at the at the national level. Well, I think, you know, there are a lot of things to say. I think we, we need ultimately to talk about the nature of media today because on the one hand, the Internet creates many openings. Uh, you would think it would help us get rid of envy because now anyone can be famous if you write your blog and you put it out there and so you don't have to, like, go through the usual channels of getting a publisher to publish your work. So it's done some good things for envy, but unfortunately... I think what what's happened more often is it's ratcheted up the focus on celebrity. How many people are citing you? How many likes does yep. a post have? And, you know, all that stuff. Now, I'm not expert on this because I don't actually belong to Facebook and I don't belong to Twitter. I like the old style of just writing an, an email to my friends. But in any case, I think people are preoccupied by citation by others. Now, even... Before that, there were citation yep. indexes and the whole idea that you promote somebody because their work is cited always seemed to me pretty silly because it might be cited as bad or as an example of some <laughs> error, and no one even bothers to ask that. But in any case, um, that was still not as bad as this social media thing where it's just the, the evanescent celebrity of some brief remark that you make that gives you your title to status. And I, so I think, what what can we do about that? Well, I guess I don't know how to use social media for those ends. So what I personally would focus on is more like, let's reinforce in the classroom and in our local community discussion groups and in fora like you know our local public libraries, which are wonderful centers now of adult education and public discussion. Let's reinforce discussion. Let's rediscover the joy of coming together and actually talking together about an issue where we're not worried about who's famous, but what we're worried about is what's true, and we can encourage that. And I, I do feel people are hungry for real discussion. People flock to bookstores, public libraries, and so on whenever they can, and this is more of an urban phenomenon right now because that's where it's possible, but, but you know, it should we should do much more to encourage that to have discussions surrounding museums, galleries, musical events of all kinds, and of course, uh, popular media like, like the musical Hamilton. So I guess to encourage real discussion is what I think would help counteract this cult of evanescent celebrity. What do you think about that? 
Well, I think it's really the, you know, it's, it's part of life that we've lost the handle on, which is character development. The role religion used to play still does, but it's a much smaller role. The role that it, public education used to play, but it's a much smaller role trying to help us cope with our own shortcomings, our own weaknesses. You know, my kids uh, want to spend less time on Facebook, but it's hard for them. I want to spend less time on Twitter, but it's hard for me. So how do we control our urges, impulses, et cetera, and lead a dignified life is – uh, well, that's part of what we're doing, I hope. It's part of what you do, teaching philosophy. I want to come back to that. It's part of what I try to do a little bit of here at Econ Talk. But I, your point about public conversation, certainly when I hold an Econ Talk in public, uh, a lot of people just want to see human beings. They don't just want to listen. Listening's wonderful. You can't be face-to-face with very many people in your life or at any one time. But uh, now and then you want a human being. You want to interact with a human being. You want to look in their eyes. You want to you want to smile at them. It's a, it's a it's a human thing yeah. that we're, we're losing a little bit of, and it's well. This, be, I wonder if there'll be some some sort of um, some sort of backlash. We'll see. Well, let's see. I, I I do feel like the what we do know, and I've just uh, finished a book on aging, which is coming out shortly, co-authored with a colleague. So one of the things we talk about is the search for meaning as people are aging, and the fact that increasingly people are seeking out for for discussion seeking out humanities courses in adult education, all kinds of places where you can really search for virtue, to put it in terms of the, the old myth. And, you know, that's partly because they've lived a life of competitive me-firstism, and then suddenly that, that doesn't seem to, to be about what would you give your life its meaning, and then you start thinking more like Hamilton, what shall I create? that's going to outlive me. So the search for meaning, I think, does bring people back if they live long enough and if they have some leisure to the real discussion and real reading, real pursuit of important good things. And and I think that's great. I think it would be good if people have that started when they're undergraduates. And one reason I'm such a big defender of humanities courses for all undergraduates is that I think then when people are much younger, they learn what it is to search for truth and to search for meaning. Of course, they should learn it also in the sciences because the science, really deep science, not just applied money-oriented science, but deep theoretical science does also search for truth and meaning. So as undergraduates, they learn to search for meaning. Then they may have to go out and do a job that doesn't seem very meaningful to them. But they, if they can keep that love going outside their work, or come back to it after they retire or in place of retiring, have a second career or something. That, I think, is very, very important. I also think, and this isn't for everyone's uh, taste, I think religion is very important as a way of keeping the search for truth and the search for meaning going all the way through a human life. When I go to synagogue, I do feel that we're all coming together to talk about real things. And, you know, sometimes maybe people are as envious in a synagogue wanting to be the president of the board or whatever as they would be anyplace else. But on the whole, you know, life is focused on meaning. And that's why people come there. They come there for, for the meaning and for the music and, and so on. And and so these are areas of life in America, the arts and humanities and and then religion, which seem to me less prone to turn people envious and more prone to turning them in the in kind of the direction of virtue. So if we can just remember that and encourage that, I think that that's helpful. Well, I'd say something on behalf of religion, which I think is often misunderstood by people who don't have a role of religion in their life. I think I, I'm I'm religious, as my listeners know. I'm a religious Jew. So I also sit in synagogue, as you do. And I think people who are not religious assume that religious people that ha- thereby know all the answers. Everything's taken care of. There are no doubts anymore, and you don't have to worry about anything, and it's all taken care of. When, in fact, for me, religion is really the way that I process and consume and think about the mystery of life and the puzzle of, of suffering and the tragedy and, and bittersweetness of, of a finite existence in such a crazy place called our lives. And I, so I just, I want to echo that. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, very nicely put. Yeah. I mean, and I would add that the Jewish tradition anyway is all about continuing the argument and taking responsibility for your choices. And uh, as a reformed Jew, I think, well, 
gee, text, tradition, history is something you should know about, but what we should really be committed to is following the moral law and making it real in your life and in other people's lives. So it's about that kind of search. And so it's not that different on a smaller, more local scale from Hamilton's uh, search for political virtue. What a good segue. But I, I want to say one more thing about the humanities. Then I want to ask you a question about philosophy and the humanities. Uh, I've been reading uh, Leisure by Joseph Pieper, which is a very strange and interesting book, uh, a book of philosophy written in, I think, 1952, where he complains about our emphasis on work. And that leisure is only to recharge your batteries to do more work. And he tries to make the case for a different kind of leisure. It happens to be in a religious context, but that's not necessary. I don't think he claims it is, but let's put that to the side. Certainly he makes the claim that there should be leisure that is, that is devoid of usefulness, not idleness, but rather exploring the philosophy, exploring the meaning of life, thinking about the transcendent. And, uh, that's a remarkably unpopular view in 2017. Um, it has been unpopular in America, even among young people now, for, for it seems a while. Uh, the humanities are taking a pounding. So I'd like to hear you say something in defense of them. In particular, uh, my, my middle son is thinking of being a philosophy major, and I think that's a great idea. I think most people would say, well, what a waste that is. So uh, I disagree. I'd like to hear your view. Well, I, of course, I, I disagree. I want to stop, though, for a minute with this word transcendent. Now, sometimes that means the focus should be the other world. As a Reformed Jew, not I Not what I mean. Not what I mean. No, no, that's not what I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could just mean going further, going deeper, going better, and that's what I think it means for me, you know, transcending our laziness, our selfishness, and trying uh, particularly to do something good for other people. Okay, so... The humanities, I actually am not as much of a pessimist as you seem to be because I've just done a new edition of my book, Not for Profit, Why Democracy Needs the Humanities. And for that, I looked at a lot of data. And in fact, in our country, where, of course, it's crucial that we have a liberal arts system, so people study humanities sometimes as humanities majors, but even if not, they'll study it in their required general education courses. There's actually a pretty robust increase in humanities enrollments, particularly in community colleges. Enrollments in the humanities are way up. And, and as I mentioned, in adult continuing education, huge upward surge. So I am not such a pessimist. I think people need, they feel a thirst for meaning. And it's a very important thing that you don't have to make that your whole life. You could say, well, I'm going to major in computer science because that's where I think the jobs are, although it's not entirely true. I think they're actually more unemployed computer science majors than unemployed English majors. But anyway, you can do what you want to do and still prepare yourself for the whole of life by taking humanities courses. And we're so lucky that we have this system. Our country, Scotland, Canada, South Korea, those are the only countries that have that liberal arts system. In most countries of the world, like all of Europe, basically, and except for Scotland and, and in all of Asia, you have to choose when you enter university one subject, and then you do only that. So it's either all philosophy or no philosophy, all literature or no literature. And so in that context, it's not surprising that parents and kids are scared. And they think, well, what am I going to do if I do three years of nothing but philosophy? What am, I, what am I equipped for? Well, I don't think they should have to make that choice. Now, there are pockets of resistance to that in the rest of the world. So, for example, all the Jesuit universities in Latin America and elsewhere are basically on the liberal arts model. But I really think that's the right way for all universities to be because university education has a twofold purpose. It prepares you for a career. But it also prepares you for being a good citizen and having a, a complete, meaningful life. And, and those are both important purposes. But we're lucky, anyway, that our university system does preserve that sense. And, and I believe that this is something that, although there are some politicians who like to beat up on the humanities, by and large, when I actually go to places and interact with the community, people from the community 
love to turn out to humanities lectures. They support the humanities, and uh, often they support it with their money as well as their, their presence. Do you think majoring in philosophy makes you a better person? Uh, I think it makes you a person who's better at detecting inconsistencies and flaws in your own reasoning and the reasoning of other people. And I think that is one part of being a good person because often there's a lot of hypocrisy in society and so people can kind of mask some bad program by making a, a, a specious argument for it. So learning to detect this kind of falsity and unmask it that's part of being a good person, but of course, I mean, look at the Socratic dialogues of, of Plato. Socrates did think that he was doing something valuable and morally good, but that assumed that people had basically good intentions. So what, what they lacked was the ability to put that all together into a coherent program. And then they got led astray by people who said, oh, well, go in this direction, go in that direction, because they, they really weren't fully clear about what they were doing. But if they didn't, if they were vicious people to begin with, then, you know, it just isn't going to help them. So you've got to hope that before people get into philosophy, they've learned a lot of other things first. I mean, that they've had a good upbringing in their family and in their community, that their parents have told them about respect and love for other people, that their schools have taught them about bigotry and bullying and so on. And I think, you know, by and large, we, we do know how to do that. We don't always do that, but um, a friend of mine is uh, an actress in a children's theater, and she acts in front of hundreds of children every week and the teachers bring the kids in and right now they've got a new play about it's based on the ugly duckling but interestingly they don't want to make it like beauty is the be all and end all so they turn it into the duckling who's different right it's kind of let's uh, water it uh, down and, 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 <laughs> well it, i mean it's not the original but, yeah. but most fairy tales are, are morally bad so anyhow this this duckling that has blue tufts rather okay. than green is bullied and made fun of and then they sing a song be an upstander not a bystander which apparently is a very common slogan now in elementary schools about, you know, if you see something bad going on, say something, don't just let it happen. So these kids are learning through theater and through their teachers and so on, the rudiments of being a good person. And then at some point when they're older and more sophisticated, they can do philosophy o over that basis. And I think that would supply something important, but it's not, of course, it's not sufficient by itself. I'm just going to add one thing I think um, I hadn't really thought of before. I'm not uh, a big fan of majoring in psychology. Uh, I'm biased against it. My father has a master's in psychology, and he told me never to study it. And so I never studied it in college. But I've become a fan of many psychologists through this program, as listeners know. And it seems to me that there's a piece of psychology, an important piece, and that is part of philosophy as well, you could kind of stretch and say it's part of economics, certainly the moral philosophy part of economics that comes from Adam Smith, and that's self-awareness. I think, I think none of these things make you a good person, but they give you the potential to be a good person. And I would argue that without self-awareness, it's going to be extremely difficult to do anything good. It also could help you be if you want to be a wicked person. Being self-aware is probably effective too. But uh, for those of us who like to think of ourselves as wanting to be good, being self-aware, which is uh, to me a lifetime challenge, is uh, something we don't really teach very well. And uh, would be a good thing if we did. I think uh, we do a little bit here at Econ Talk. We talk a lot about confirmation bias, which is a huge thing. But I think it's um, it's a big part of life that that we don't think about very systematically. Yeah, I agree entirely. And I do think that Socrates was, didn't get the whole thing right. I have a very strong interest in psychoanalysis, and I had a wonderful discussion recently with my colleague and friend Jonathan Lear, apropos of his new book, Wisdom One from Illness. But we had a kind of public forum together in Hyde Park where we talked about how philosophy 
needs to learn from psychoanalysis and how psychoanalysis needs to learn from philosophy. I, I think they both have things to learn from each other, but certainly a, a philosophy that doesn't care about the unconscious, about the deep inner life of the person's emotions and so on, that's, that's not going to be enough. And so we need more than one type of understanding. And then the question is, of course, how do you, how do, you do that? And I ended up asking Jonathan, who, who does, in fact, see psychoanalytic patients on a regular basis as well as writing and teaching, you know, what else can we do if we're interested in that kind of understanding, but we're not actually practicing analysts? How, what do we do to make it real? And I struggle with that. And I try to do it by writing in about the emotions and writing in a way that shows that kind of understanding. But I'm aware that the nature of the communication I have with my own students and with my own readers is in, in some ways only skin deep. I mean, I'm not... I'm not an analyst. And so then that other part that goes beneath their skin, someone like Jonathan has to do that part. Yeah, and that's um, it's a complicated thing, the human psyche, consciousness, um, what we really want. All of those things are, are part of leading a good life and understanding them and understanding your, yourself. I want to I finish with a point that was made by one of the – Critics of your essay, Boston Review asked some people to respond to. We'll put up links to all of the whole forum. Uh, Professor of Philosophy at Emory, Marta Jimenez, uh, had an interesting approach. She said, uh, not quoting her, but her point was that the focus on being in the room where it happens, the focus on being a – I'm now – belatedly bring us back to Hamilton, uh, that the focus on being an insider, to, to be at the levers of power, is not the only way that we can make the world a better place. And, of course, we do that in many, many ways in the, in the small, but those small steps add up. And we reflect on that and this idea that in a democracy, and I don't think it's necessarily in a democracy, I'd say it's in any civil society where there's freedom to associate with other people to create organizations that help people voluntarily, uh, that, that that's another way to make the world a better place, not just in Washington, D.C. Oh, I couldn't agree more. And I even I said so in my you reply did, to her. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that was a great point because, I mean, of course, Hamilton is a drama and it has to hook people in by a glamorous story of a leader. But the fact is that all of us have contributions to make that are good. And um, there are so many ways we can do it. And we just have to think, what are you good at doing? If you're a doctor, well, that leads you in one direction. If you can do something in the arts, that leads you in another direction. But yeah, I mean, even just something like uh, in my synagogue, we have this food garden that provides fresh produce for the poor. It's the largest such food garden in the United States. So you work in the garden and just so many different things, bringing up children is, of course, one of the most important ways of contributing something fine to the world. So, yeah, I, I think um, Socrates didn't understand that either because he really, uh, Plato's vision of how you could contribute was pretty male-centered and it didn't include the family at all yeah. and so on. So, you know, we can just uh, think about all the different ways you can contribute. And then the question is, what? What's the one where you fit in best and what, what con contribution that, that would bring you joy and satisfaction? Because that's crucial. Are you best placed to make? Yeah, I, I think about the end of Middlemarch. Uh, it's one of my favorite endings of a novel. The last line, which is not a spoiler, by the way, but it, uh, it's, it gives away nothing of the plot. But the last line is uh, the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric, unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lives faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. And we focus on those, and a quote, we focus on those who are, you get the monuments, certainly here in Washington, D.C. we do that. But the, a lot of, of what makes life glorious and wonderful and real takes place over the breakfast table and at community places like churches, synagogues, and mosques, at associations like food banks and other places where people come together to help other people. And I think we need to remember that and not think it all comes through power and legislation. 
Oh, absolutely. I guess the only thing I don't like about that is that at the end of a novel about the limits of aspiration that characterized a woman's life in the 19th century, that's a bit of a cop-out to me. Because it says, well, never mind that the big positions are not open to women. Forget about that. You can contribute in small ways. And so, I mean, while it's perfectly true, it's still a horrible injustice and one that we're still living with that the wider range of options is not fully open to women. So I guess I think George Eliot, who after all had to publish under the name George uh, rather than Mary Ann, she was just trying to wrestle with her own personal limitations, which were terribly wrong and unjust. But I would say, I agree with you. It's a great point. But I would add that uh, I, I would never, again, going to my own children, I would never want any of them to aspire to be president of the United States. And I think, you know, it's interesting <laughs> that we say, oh, you know, there's never been a woman. There will be a woman president of the United States someday. That'll be a, probably a good thing for the world, a good thing for America, a good thing for American women. But I don't think it's something that anyone should aspire to. And that uh, uh, puts me in a small uh, group of people, I suppose. No, I guess I think what's most important for one's children is that they do something they love that does make a contribution. And I'm just so thrilled that my daughter is doing legal work on behalf of animal rights that she really loves in a great organization. It's not one of these $200,000 law firm jobs, but thank goodness it isn't. You know, it's, it's actually more meaningful than that. And she's doing something real. So I agree totally. My guest today has been Martha Nussbaum. Martha, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Okay, thanks so much. I really enjoyed that very, very much. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.